Hey, Deserve listeners, 90 Day Fiance. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. As always, don't use YouTube as a replacement for therapy. If you need a therapist, get one. You deserve it. Let's watch. So now will be my turn. Yeah. Stripes. Hmm. All right, so this is awkward. Bilal is presumably trying to help uh, Shida and Bilal's kids bond. And there's not much that Bilal is doing. I, you know, I don't fault Bilal for not having any skills in this. It's actually a skill set. I am not very good at this. If I were in Bilal's shoes, I'm. Uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'd be. I feel like I'd be better than this. But I am not great. My co-host on the podcast, Umberto, is actually very good at this. My mom is very good at this. My mom. If she were here, she would have everyone laughing and interacting, and particularly with the kids. She would know what kids of that age, because my mom had a daycare in our house for decades, and and also was just very interested in, in kids and entertaining kids, and so she would know exactly what to do with them that would maybe, I don't know, coloring or throwing a ball or something, get the kids involved, and then then she would get Shida, you know, involved as well. But they're playing pool, which, you know, could be fun. But for Shida, I don't think she's ever played before. They're explaining a regular, I don't know what you call it. It's regular American bar pool, you know, eight, nine ball, right? Anyway, stripes and solids. But so, and it's, Bilal isn't, facilitating he's just like let's play pool now maybe there's an awkward beginning and and you just you just gotta get through the awkwardness but um yeah what do you guys call your um mother's husband like uncle or well first off she has the tip of the cue directly onto the ground which uh like really it shouldn't irk me but <laughs> and she doesn't know someone could just say oh you don't because you know the tip is delicate one and two you're going to get all your chalk off so can you tell I went to a lot of bars and played a lot of pool <laughs> in my 20s <laughs> the monkey pub was a place I was at often in Seattle anyway so yeah she uh I just want to just you know just flip flip that around but anyway okay she's about to ask what to you know what they want to call her uh, uh, you know, mom or Shida or whatever. It's a good conversation. Let's see what happens. His first name, brother, what? His first name. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so I, I think she just asked, what do you call your stepdad? And they're saying his first name. And they're like, yeah, that's that's what we do. So, okay, the kids are answering it. I think they know the landscape a little bit here. And Bilal did talk with the kids prior to Shida coming, which was a good conversation of just like, look, it's up to you. You don't have to call her mom. You can call her whatever you want, you know, within reason, of course, but no pressure, whatever you're, whatever you want to do. So, you know, let's see how they manage it. What do you want us to call you? <laughs> Maybe one day Umi. Umi? Yeah. And Umi means mother, right? Yeah. It's okay. So on one level, it's going a little fast, right? Uh, and I don't think the kids are enthusiastic about that plus it sounds like they call their stepdad not dad but by you know his name and so they're like uh what do you want us to call she's like well i want you to call me umi which means mother and she's saying yeah i do okay so on one level you think well it's a little fast but on the other level that's a good sign right that as a stepmom she's in it to win it and now we'll see what she says here. I hope she says, you don't have to. You don't have to ever call me that. But if you ask me what I'd like to be called, that's that's how I want you to see me. I want I want us to be close. I want this to be serious. And I, I take it seriously. And I, I don't want to be like this distant person. I, I want to be a part of your life. And so that, that's a good instinct. And uh, it's up to her, not every step parent would want that or strive for that or anything else. You know, there's different approaches to it, particularly by the time they're this age. But so, so I don't know. Well, hope the big thing here is that the kids don't feel pressured, especially when they're on camera. And you know me, I, I'll say this again, that I, 
do we believe that when kids consent to be on a reality TV show that they understand what they are consenting to when they sign a contract? We don't allow them to sign other kinds of contracts, right? Like to sign away their future finances. They, we understand that they can't understand those consequences and we don't, we just say, well, let's just not have them make those decisions because even if they were educated on the consequences and signed in the dotted line, we understand that their children, they don't really understand how the world works. They don't, they don't know how they're going to feel when they're an adult. So let's wait until they're an adult. So I'm just always thinking that when children are on these shows. The other thing I'm thinking is, is this show doing, you know, making, putting them in situations that's going to result in them as an adult to look back and be ashamed or angry that they weren't told what was going to happen? Uh, you know, often on these shows, that's not happening. You know, Darcy and Stacy, for example, with um, Aspen and Annika, they, you know, they don't, they're not usually doing things that are. Uh, humiliating in any way other shows do you know, honey boo boo these i never watched that show so i don't know but I, I have a feeling that that show was pushing the limit and really focused on the kids and you know perhaps manipulating the kids to produce content for them to uh, to air but anyway so let's see how they navigate this now Bilal could be involved Again, the main mes message is, kids, you can do whatever you want, but I'm on a path that I would love it if I could be close to you and you saw me as a mother, but it's up to you. Let's see what happens here. It's just a tone of um, respect. You know, it's mm. like a, it's kids normally say in my country. Yeah. Just want to turn that cue around. <laughs> just like, <laughs> now maybe she doesn't want to get the chalk on, on her nice outfit, but you know, just, that thing. But then she says, it's a sign of respect. Okay, that's not the message. Because, so what? If the kids don't want to call you that, they're being disrespectful? Hmm. Which, which ball are you going for? Shada says that she wants us to call her Umi, which means mother. I definitely take that in consideration, but honestly, I don't know how to feel about that. Right, so the kids are in a bind. I, I think it's obvious that the kids aren't comfortable with that <laughs> the kids are being nice and saying like i honestly don't know what to say about that i think if they were being honest it'd be like i don't want to call her that yet maybe later but not now i don't know who she is i have a mom so they're already in a bind not only in front of shida but also in front of the cameras you know it's it's an uncomfortable position to be in the other thing is it's like you know there's a clear rubber stopper at the end of one side of the queue that i think would one would intuit that's the part you put on the floor still getting adjusted to the whole new wife it's going to take a while Right now, I think I just call it Shida. Yep, me too. We'll see how it goes. Okay, good. So the kids are like, for now, call her Shida. We'll see how it goes. That tells me, I think, that they feel the freedom to be who they want to be and to say what they want to say. Bilal, I think, has explicitly, or I know, has at least once, and maybe more often, explicitly supported the kids in what they want to do with that. So, I don't know, maybe there was a longer conversation there. Like I said, if Shida was like, I would just really love that, she she might have said that and they edited it out, I don't know. I would hope, I mean, Shida doesn't seem like the sort of person that would like demand respect, you know, I am the stepmother and you will, I don't think she's like that. So I, I think it was more of a, a human desire to to be seen and as an important figure, as a mom in, in some mom figure in someone's life. I would say whether it's Umi or anything else that we can think that'd be a fun, you know, cool name, uh, but also something that's comfortable, right. you know, for you guys. Okay, good. So Bilal gets involved and says, you know, he's not pushing back at Shida. He's not like, he, you know, he's not saying something like, well, Shada, you're going a little faster. Well, Shada, you know, you're not their mom. He's not attacking. He kind of is diplomatic about like, well, whether it's Umi or some other cool name, 
uh, uh, it's great, but you know, let's let's do something that the kids feel comfortable with. So he's he's doing his role, which is facilitator here. It shouldn't be on Shai to, to facilitate this because she doesn't have a relationship with him yet. In my culture, when you have like a bonus mom, we normally refer to that person as Umi. And it's a title of love and concern and respect. Right. And in the States, we typically don't do things like that. Like in East Asian cultures, which is almost like two fifths of the population of the planet, you know, when you include China and Korea, Japan and the Philippines and Indonesia and these places. Uh, and then when, of course, you include India, South Asia, then you have more than half of the population. So to, to generalize to half the population of the United, of the of the earth is hard to do but generally speaking there is more of a respect for elders and there are there are language markers to uh, to go along with that and in uh, for example in Filipino culture if you are an older relative or even just friend of the family I believe the word is manong I think it I think it's non-gendered or at least that's anyway so it there's just these words of respect to older even if i think you have a cousin that's older you you call him this name essentially i think it's like uncle or auntie or something um, and in in my family japanese american family uh, uncle and auntie were very important labels and we would apply those labels to people that weren't necessarily related but were close to the family and, and older, you know, it was, it was a marker. And if you like it, to call my aunts and uncles by their name without saying uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so is um, it, it feels bad. Sometimes I do it like I, I have a, an aunt that's very close to me that I'll sometimes refer to her as Carol. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of Carols in the Japanese American uh, uh, sansei community. <laughs> There's there's certain names it's, there's you know, there's lists of like you know you're Japanese American when you have like three uncles named Joe and uh, you know you have an you have a you have an Auntie Karen and an Auntie Carol <laughs> and uh, I forget the the names that are typical uh, Gloria is another Japanese American name anyway so um, point is is that for Shida I think she comes from that culture where even prior to a relationship building, you would just automatically be given a, a label of respect because to not do that is actually disrespectful. Whereas in the States, it's not disrespectful to not have that label. It's not disrespectful for the kids to call her Shida. It's not seen as some kind of like, did you just call your stepmom by her first name without giving her the proper label there it, it, whereas in other parts of the world it, it, that's how it would be like did did you just did you just call auntie carol carol like she's not carol you she's she's auntie carol and so uh, it makes sense but and hopefully Bilal can explain that to her just like no no you know it, this isn't disrespectful it's just in in the states it's really common to call stepmoms particularly at your phase just by your first name it's, and we don't really have, an, do we have other names for that? I, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, I can't really think of any other names. Sometimes people will differentiate between like mother and mama and mommy. You know, they'll be like, well, you're my mother and you're my mommy or something. But it's not always the case. And yeah, I'm just, I can't think of, stepmom certainly is, but you wouldn't say, hey, stepmom. You know, you wouldn't address someone that way. I think, yeah, I think it's very common just the first name. Because I'm trying to think of other iterations. Like, you wouldn't call her by her last name, you know, Ms. So-and-so. You wouldn't call her auntie or auntie or whatever. Yeah, I think there people would typically, it's just first name. And, yeah. So hopefully Shida, hopefully Bilal can explain that to Shida. I'll give it time and hopefully the children decides to call me that. Do you want any kids? Eventually. When you said eventually, how long has he been cool? That is a question your dad needs to answer, not me. Uh, they're asking you questions, not me. 
Well, okay. So if this is, and by the way, he has a fraternity paddle. I was in a fraternity and have a paddle as well. It's a ceremonial paddle. Uh, it goes back. <laughs> I don't know if you care to know this, but in fraternities, there's a, a tradition of spanking. The, it sounds ridiculous when I say it out loud, because it is. Uh, members, when they become full members, you know, you, you pledge and then you're in this probationary per- period. And in order to be fully fledged members, it's almost like being. You know, when gang members will beat someone into, jump someone into the gang, it's this way, it's this rite of passage. I'm guessing it's ancient. It feels like it could be ancient. I don't know. Maybe it's just a product of American masculinity, toxic masculinity. Well, it is that too. But yeah, do I show a picture of me being spanked? (laughs) I will. Uh, So let me tell you a story. Uh, Who cares? You know, uh, do people care? No one cares. I... It was a big thing in our frat, and the practice was told to us. And I would see the older guys in the fraternity with their paddles on the wall, and they typically looked like this. In fact, you can get these ready-made with those letters. There's companies that will, they have all the letters, and they'll glue it on there, and so you just order it. But it can be expensive, and I was always kind of a do-it-yourself guy and probably overly creative, obnoxiously creative. And so, you know, I'm 18, and I designed this paddle that is actually in the shape of a musical note because I fashioned myself a musician and still do and I made it in my garage with my friend he, he made his and I made mine I think he made his like really big part of it was if you made this really obnoxious paddle but it would still pass as a paddle then they couldn't really hit you that hard because you know those kinds of paddles you could really you could really hurt someone with something. That's like a weapon. But if you make a paddle that's really unwieldy, it's hard to, because we heard, because we didn't know, your big brother is sort of like your mentor in the fraternity was in charge of paddling you. It, it, I didn't know this, but what ended up happening was at our initiation dance, which is like in December or January or something, they do it in front of everyone. And, you know, they do it in front of your date. Almost everyone, they act like they're going to hit you hard, but then they just kind of tap. And then it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> they didn't hit me hard. I don't know if they do it anymore, but I don't know. Uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, there's that a picture of me being paddled. <laughs> and I've done, I've talked about my experiences in a fraternity before, but just a little a little snippet in case you don't know or don't remember. I, in 1989, when I was graduating from high school, I didn't know anything about fraternities or sororities other than the fact that my sister was in a sorority at the University of Washington, which is where I was going. And I actually wanted to live at home because my mom did everything for me. I was spoiled to some extent. She did all my laundry. She, you know, bought all the food (laughs) and living at home just seemed like the thing to do. But my sister and my mom were like, and I kind of floated that. And my sister and my mom were like, no, 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 you're going to live on campus and you're going to live in a fraternity. They just told me that because my mom was actually in a sorority too at at University of uh, Washington State University. So I thought, oh, okay. They didn't even say dorms. I don't remember dorms ever being dormitory, like it's an apartment for college kids, being being an option. I think it was just considered like ludicrous that I would live in the dorms or something. So I, so you, what they call rush, and essentially you go to all these fraternities over the summer and the fraternities and you try to suss each other out, sort of like dating, essentially. You as a potential member are saying, do I want to be with these guys? You know, what's the culture? Because every fraternity has a completely different culture and not by design. Similar vibes just attract similar vibes and repel other vibes. And so, and also the fraternity is trying to figure out whether they want you in their frat. And so when I was doing that, I found that I felt very comfortable with the nerd frat. It's sort of a, I mean, they were, they were great guys and I wouldn't say they're particularly nerdy, but they weren't the cool, the cool frats I would go to. And I was like, ugh, this does, this does not feel good. You know, it was a bunch of D bags with money and trying to look cool. I mean, that's me judging. But anyway, point is, is that there was a, there was a kind of the misfit frat (laughs) that I felt very comfortable in and ended up joining that frat and then quickly realized that everyone hated frat people. I didn't even know. (laughs) Like, 
I didn't know. I mean, not everyone, but there was a there was a animosity between the dorm kids and the frat and sororities, and I didn't even know that. I thought, is that I, why does everyone? We don't hate them. Why do they hate us? You know, and it's, it, well, it was because there we did bad things as a group sometimes. But anyway, so I. Uh, overall, though, the fraternity experience was actually really positive. Uh, a lot of friends I'm still friends with. Uh, technically, I'm friends with everyone I was in the frat with, like a hundred different guys. I'm friends on Facebook with them. We go to football games together. Networking can actually be helped. My accountant is was my unofficial big brother in the frat, actually. And um, and I don't know. There's a certain kind of trust that you have with people that you lived with and went through so much with, you know, because there'd be times when we would have rivalries with other fraternities on our street and everyone in the frat, like, you know, 60, 70 guys would flood out into the street and and fight each other. <laughs> I mean, or uh, the frat right next to us, we would vandalize each other's whole house. This is ridiculous, you know, but it was brief, but sometimes it would come to that, you know, because you put that many 19 year olds in the span of five blocks now for some of you you have pr probably had horrific experiences is in fraternities because toxic masculinity is quite rampant in fraternities particularly in the past alcoholism date rape situations so i'm not saying that those don't happen and they did unfortunately when i was in the fraternity and it was a huge eye-opener i learned a lot about human nature and about misogyny and toxic masculinity and alcoholism and social psychology like everything but overall it, it, it you know people in fact when those things did happen from my memory as a group we actually tended to react well um, there was an accusation from a, a sorority girl against one of our members and we debated for a long time about what to do. And in the end, uh, we took disciplinary action against the uh, member and kicked him out. And that was all we could do. We, you know, we weren't the law. And of course, the law was already involved. So, you know, we wanted to stand up for the victim, even though we didn't really even know her. And it was just their, their accounts against each other. And in the end, we said, well, there, you know, there's enough data there to, to suggest, and, you know, this is 1989, 1990, when uh, well before knowledge that we have today about such things. So, you know, now I'm not saying we didn't have problems, but I'm not saying it was perhaps the way it's typically stereotyped. Anyway, so yeah, that's me rambling about that topic. <laughs> but anyway, so Bilal is um, trying to help. Let's see what they say here. Young lady. Dad, do you want more kids? Would you like another brother and sister? Uh oh, right. So <laughs> I forgot. The, they uh, were asking Shida, do you want to have kids? I'm guessing prompted by other people. It doesn't sound like the sort of thing that kids like that would blurt out. I mean, they might be curious about it. But anyway, so they asked Shida. And then Shida says, well, you have to ask Bilal about that. And she says, yes, I do want kids eventually, meaning not right away. Bilal says, well, the two of you, you all have to talk about it. And it's like, no, <laughs> like the kids should not be having one, no. Two, Shida and the kids are just meeting. Do they, should they really be talking about this? You should be coloring or throwing a ball or playing Wii or what, what do kids do? Uh, you know, Oculus or something. <laughs> Uh, something fun, something just bonding, but let's see how this goes. I don't know about that. Brother. Brother? Uh, no more sisters. <laughs> well, you know, we will we'll, we'll think about it more, you know, and obviously only a lot of sides, you know, but we'll, we'll try to decide if that's something in the future, you know. Okay, really awkward. <laughs> really awkward response. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine that it's all up in the air because you've been in person dating now for nine days. So yeah, let's let's just think about that later. So after editing everything, I discovered I had two smaller videos of two different couples. And instead of putting out two small videos, I thought I'd make one big video. And so I'm gonna include this couple with the past couple. So let's watch. You're on your own this morning, sorry. <laughs> Don't just get used to that. <laughs> okay. 
Well, it's the first meal you'll cook in America. Look at it that way. Eve made me frustrated because I expected her to cook for me because my mom, she usually cooks for me and watch my needs. Yikes. I haven't been reacting publicly on the YouTube channel to this couple, Muhammad and Eve, but just to catch you up, I took a little bit of notes here because I uh, sometimes have a hard time keeping track of people at the beginning of the season, but Eve is 48 from New Mexico. She works in acupuncture, I believe. And Muhammad is 25 from Egypt, and he approached her on Instagram, and they've had 22 days together total, and they've been online dating for, I don't know, a number of months. And now he's in the States, in New Mexico, and they are now seeing if they work well together before they can get married. And he's been talking about how he, right now he's talking about how He's upset that she is going to work and he wants her to cook for him. And he's upset, even though he's staying home all day and doing nothing. I mean, you think you'd want something to pass the time. But anyway, so he, I don't know, he's not yelling at her. It's hard to say if the producers aren't behind this a little bit, but but he's saying, so that's the theme of this relationship that at least the editors are trying to tell us is that he's looking for a mom and not really a wife. And, you know, that tends to trigger people a lot. You know, think about the Debbie Colt situation. People really love to kind of get their hands around that kind of storyline. So do I think that Muhammad is truly seeing Eve as a mom and not a wife? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. I, that would be strange and, and odd. Do I think that he lacks independence? I mean, certainly we're seeing a data point there. Do we see evidence of sexism and requiring his wife to be his servant? And does he come from a culture in Egypt where that's the norm? I don't know. You tell me if you're from that region of the world or have experience with that. But other parts of the world sometimes have more traditional gender roles for people. I don't know, but uh, now I will say that he's not, he's not like getting angry or rageful or anything. He, but he seems pretty convinced that his reaction is okay, <laughs> which I have to say, she's being extremely nice. She's, you know, she lays it all out for him and which makes sense because he's in a foreign country, doesn't know his way around, but but he certainly, you know, it's not hard to make your own food. So if I need something, I expect Eve to do the same. Thank you, babe, I'll see you this afternoon. There was also a conversation about a bidet. He apparently had a conversation with her prior to arriving that in his culture, he needs to have a bidet. And she apologized nicely saying that she didn't get one because she didn't have time and or didn't hook it up or something and he was upset about that there seemed to be some cultural misunderstanding there i think from her perspective she thought that it was just a convenience thing that he was looking for but i think what he was saying or what i've heard from other people from egypt they will say that yeah it is a cultural norm but it's also a religious thing there's uh, practices regarding cleanliness that need to be strictly adhered to. I don't know if that's where Muhammad is coming from, but uh, they seem to ha have a misunderstanding about that. So he is still wanting a bidet and, and they're talking about it. And okay, you know, it's a misunderstanding. I, I don't know what to think about this couple so far. Th there's not a lot of data there. They seem to really barely know each other, at least on camera. They're, they don't seem to have a lot of chemistry or or I don't know, connection, who knows, maybe behind the scenes they do. Uh, he comes across as kind of, uh, the word for it is spacey. I, I don't wanna put him down and I'm not, I'm just saying he seems on the mellow side of things, I guess what I'll say. What does that say about him? Nothing really, but it, it, I don't know how to read it yet. Um, but let's watch. 
This is not what I was expecting for my future wife. I need salt and I can't find it. Oh my God, what are I gonna do? I'm already here one day and I started to miss my mother. Well, of course, you are in a, you're on the other side of the planet and yeah, you're missing your mom. Who knows how they edited that right there? Is it that he is a man child? What's going on? I, I don't know. I, I feel like he's, I, I feel like we're gonna see him adjust is my guess, but let's see. I think I left the oven. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, uh, leaving the oven on is, uh, could have been a disaster. <laughs> I expected my first day in America to be relaxing, not facing new things like this day it Eve bought for me. Yeah, it's actually kind of hard to install those. Uh, I, I've installed a few uh, in the past, and uh, what I would tell them to do is look on YouTube. There's probably 10 very experienced people who have installed that exact model, and if you just follow along on YouTube, that's what I did. And uh, not do that. But this tons of a day, it's not going well. And I cannot live without a day. I cannot do that. All right, who knows? But if we're looking for signs of dependency and childishness, when we are younger and or dependent and we're faced with something that's complicated, as children, we have the luxury to just walk away. As adults, we don't typically do that. Like for me, when I was installing the bidets, I absolutely ran into problems or confusion like, well, wait, where does this thing go? Or I don't understand. And if I just dropped it and walked away, like no one else is going to do it because I understand that <laughs> and I'm, it's my job. And, you know, so when you're at the top of your own pyramid, so to speak, you learn to just power through. You just got to figure it out. You start asking around or you start just experimenting. You don't just walk away. We just saw him just walk away. I don't know what that means, but I'm guessing <laughs> the way this is edited, when Eve gets home, he's going to say, now that you've worked all day, I want you to make me dinner and I want you to install the bidet, you know, the way a child would. And unless she has some special skill, maybe she's an expert at that sort of thing. And he's just like, look, you're, you're just a lot better. But if she doesn't have any special skills around that, then yeah. It's going to be a different situation. Close that, please. Come on in. I definitely hope that he does get along well with Theron because my son has special needs. And I know it's difficult. It's difficult on me sometimes. I love my son, but there's challenges. And yeah, and I completely forgot that huge factor that she has a special needs kid that is, you know, obviously dependent on her in the appropriate way. And for Muhammad, how is he going to fit into all that? We don't know, you know, it, they're in the beginning, maybe things will work out, but I'm guessing we're gonna see something that's gonna bug me in a second. It's Muhammad! It's, it's Muhammad. Yes! <laughs> How are you? Finally. <laughs> I mean, that, that's nice. It's good to see, good to see. Theron for the first time and he gave me a hug. This hug made me feel that I'm home. I'm so happy! <laughs> Yay! Group hug. Group hug. Group hug. <laughs> now, of course, this show tends to disappoint. He has a interesting band-aid on his neck. I don't know. What is that? I mean, if I saw that in a movie, I would think it was some sort of matrix port of some sort. But he is... Uh, so the show often will dash my hopes and dreams and happiness and if this doesn't work out then it's yet another example of exposing a child to a very early relationship and creating attachment you know think of Jimena and her kids you know I, I get the impulse to some extent and, and there's nothing inherently damaging to kids about that that you know there are plenty of single parents who will date 
uh, for years and might periodically introduce those relationships to the children. So it's not automatically a problem. Obviously, it could actually even enhance things. But it's always this worry of mine that this isn't going to work out. You know, he's really happy to see Muhammad. And what happens if they break up and he goes home and he never sees him again? Like, is how is he going to feel about that? All right. Well, I want to thank you for liking this video if you have or any of my other videos. I actually look at those stats and it helps my self-esteem. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.